This is Health Call Online, the place for extended versions of interviews you hear on a weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour, now heard on more stations around the country and national syndication. You know, America certainly is growing older as us baby boomers hit the retirement age that increases the burden on health care just at the same time that America's doctors are undergoing an epidemic of stress and burnout. A survey by the American Medical Association says in 2021, the number of doctors reporting symptoms of burnout left up to 63%, a problem so big, the AMA considers it a crisis. Now, what's behind all of that? There have been certainly lots of changes in medicine. The pandemic didn't help, but the corporatization of medicine is forcing many doctors to practice in a way that well, really maybe doesn't measure up to why they got into healthcare in the first place. That's led to an increase in a different type of medical practice following the model of something called direct primary care. We're going to talk today to Dr. Jared Wegman, who stepped out of the traditional world, got out of the hamster wheel, and opened his own direct primary care practice, Indiana Direct Primary Care, about a year ago. Let's touch base and just see how it's going. So, Dr. Wegman, thanks for joining us. Glad you're here. I'm kind of curious, let's just start right there. Um, you're about a year in. Um, what are you loving so far? There's so many things to love about this form of practice. When you talk about the way that medicine has become and the and the burnout and you know everything that goes along with that, especially over the last couple of years where the pandemic was, you know, really stressful for everyone. The great things about it are, you know, one is we get to manage the practice how we want to. You know, nobody's telling me how I have to see patients, how quickly I have to see patients, you know, what what I can do in that time frame that I need to send them to different places. Um, and then being able to spend the time with the patients is, is fantastic. I mean, you know, one of the things we learned in medical school from the very get-go is that if you just have time to sit and talk to patients, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. They'll tell you, you know, where to go. And so when you don't have that time to sit with people at five or 10 minutes, you know, you don't have time for them to get that story out. You don't have time. So what, what you do is a shotgun approach of all these tests and all these other things that they don't necessarily need. If you just sit and talk to them, you can really focus their care. And you know, the one thing I really love about direct primary care is, is not just the time, but it's the limit of the number of patients that we have in our practices. You know, it, most direct primary care practices across the country have 500 or less people. Um, and when that's the case, uh, when people walk through my door, I don't have to look at my computer and say, hey, um, you know, who is that? Uh, you know, when when my patients walk through the door, I can be like, you know, hey, Tom, hey, Jim, hey, Karen, you know, I, I know them. I know what they're, you know, why they're coming in. I, I don't have to look at the schedule for that. And that, that's what's great about it. And in our particular practice, we have a gym associated with our practice beside it. And so we'll see patients pop into the gym and, you know, I'm able to go over there and you know, check up on them and just say, hey, how you doing? You know, are things going okay? Is there anything you need? Uh, but again, I don't have to look at a schedule. I don't have to figure out, oh, shoot, who is that? I know them. It's great. Yeah. That's a that's a great summary. Uh, for people who don't know much about direct primary care, give us the backstory. So I've always heard it referred to, and I've referred to it as the Netflix of medicine. So I, I pay a subscription fee for access to you and all your services, but broaden that out for people who may not be aware. Sure. So, yeah, I, I think direct primary care was really born out of something, um, and I think people misunderstand it a little bit because of what traditionally happened probably 10 or 15 years ago, something called concierge medicine. So concierge mm -hmm. medicine was, you know, kind of for the elite. It was above and beyond insurance. So back in the day when people used to have deductibles of, you know, $500, which, you know, really doesn't exist anymore, um, mm -hmm. You know, there was the elite that, that paid extra to be able to get into their doctor when they wanted to, they, to have extra access to their doctor, um, to have their doctor sort of take care of other things that they wouldn't necessarily do above and beyond insurance. So they would charge insurance um, for their basic visit, but then also charge them a monthly fee. Um, and so that was meant for the elite. And I think a lot of people misunderstand what direct primary care is, is that it's a concierge model of medicine um, where we do the same thing. And that's just not true we actually eliminate the insurance completely. Uh, the reason we do that is because it actually turns out to be cheaper. And there's a number of studies across the country that show that a lot of people with insurance or without insurance, both, um, with high deductible plans, they end up paying less through a direct primary care model um, and that monthly fee basis uh, than they would if they were to go to traditional healthcare systems with that same deductible. 
And, you know, direct primary care now gives people the ability who don't have insurance or access to affordable insurance, the ability to come to the doctor for a reasonable monthly fee. So from that perspective, direct primary care has taken that sort of concierge model and brought it to the masses uh, at an affordable rate, but also does provide some of those concierge things, which, you know, I would argue probably aren't really concierge. You know, when you call your doctor's office and don't hear back from them for three days, you know, when you hear back from them the same day, that's really what should happen. That's not concierge to me. So let's go forward on the idea of access and contact. So you give your patients your cell phone number, I can call you, I can text you, and outside of office hours, right? I mean, anytime I have an issue? Absolutely. So, and I tell patients all the time, you know, they have that access and the ability to do that. Obviously, at midnight on a Tuesday, I'm probably not going to be able to answer that. I'm probably sleeping. Um, so if there's any urgencies or emergencies, you know, during those times, you know, you can certainly try, uh, but I may not answer back until the next morning. But, you know, people are pretty surprised that a lot of times, you know, especially spring break. So we're getting past spring break here and I've got a lot of um, my members that are traveling. And, you know, members have contacted me either right before travel or, you know, they got to their destination and say, hey, doc, this happened to me. You know, I, I hate to bother you, but, you know, is there anything you can do? Sure. If we can call on a prescription to them in Texas, um, which is one of our, what my members want, you know, and, and so it prevents them from having to go to an urgent care out there. Um, it's a simple thing that I can take care of for them. So, you know, it's great for people to have that access, you know people always get concerned, you know, oh, they've got direct access to you. Does that mean they're calling and texting and, 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 you know, all the time? Not really. You know, most people are very respectful of, you know, what time it is and things. And the only times they reach out when it's later or weekends is when they really need something. Um, and, you know, most of the time I'm able to take care of it, but occasionally it's not something I can do. Um, it's not something I'm available for. So, yeah, there are times when, you know, they may have to seek out other care. We may have to delay it a day or, you know, whatever that means. But, you know, they have the access to me and they, they oftentimes just being able to um, talk to me and say, hey, I'll see you tomorrow gets them through. Uh, doesn't hmm. mean that they have something that they need right now. They think they might need it right now, but they're not sure. So being able yeah. to talk to me and no, nope, that can wait till tomorrow. I'll be happy to, to take care of that for you. So when, uh, so no boundary issues, people aren't abusing, that's good to know. Are, are you seeing a different kind of patient? Are you seeing people who are maybe sicker and more intense need of care or those who are healthier and want to maintain their health? Where, where, are you, where, where does your patients fall on that scale? I think the vast majority are healthier. Um, the struggle that I have in my practice, at least with direct primary care is, and I think probably across the country too, is that the sicker people um, still feel like they need uh, their primary care doc within the system. And by system, I mean the big healthcare system. And, you know, Fort Wayne, Indiana, that's different than other places, but every, every city has their big hospital um, systems as they have. And, you know, those systems sort of feed into themselves. And I think a lot of the sicker people like to have a primary care doc within that system because they think that's the only path to do that. And so there's some, some misunderstanding out there regarding that. And they also want to make sure that all their specialists and everybody are within the same system. But what we find is really when I can get a couple of those patients to cross over into our practice, oftentimes what happens is we end up being able to take care of, uh, you know, 70, 80 percent of what their needs are uh, on a regular basis. And they don't need to see their specialists as often. They don't need to go into their specialist office every three months for refills of medications because that's something we can do. We have the time to address the five or six problems, seven problems that they have, where the primary care doctors and the traditional health systems, unfortunately, just don't have time to do that. They have the training. They just don't have the time. Yeah. So explain that whole specialist relationship in a hospital network. I mean, it seems like when you in the old, well... I have gone to physicians, to my general practice guy, and then get referred out to a specialist very frequently. How can, how can you provide care and not have to do that? I mean, sometimes we do. I mean, it, just depending on the situation, there's obviously certain things that the primary care doctor's office can't do. So we do have to refer off in those circumstances. Oftentimes what happens with referrals uh, for new diagnoses for things is it just takes time to do that. Um, use uh, an irregular heartbeat, for instance. Um, irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation is something that, you know, if it's seen in a primary care doctor's office, oftentimes they'll refer very quickly to a cardiologist's office um, to do some testing, to, to, you know, to figure things out, to get on medications. 
and that may be appropriate, but a lot of times that stuff can be started in the primary care doctor's office before they ever get to the cardiologist's office. So we can do a lot of that testing beforehand, so that way when they do go see the heart doctor, which takes them maybe two or three months to get in, the heart doctor already has everything they need to figure out where they need to go with the plan. And then once I see them for that visit, once I set that plan, you know, oftentimes the cardiologist may want to see them every three months. So they set that visit up. Oftentimes they don't actually see the cardiologist at that point. They see the nurse practitioner because it's a pretty standard thing. There's not a lot to do. They may see the doctor once a year, the nurse practitioner the other three times. Um, that's not always necessary. Why not go back to your primary care doctor's office who can manage those same medications as long as the plan's already been set? Hmm. I get that. So we're just all trained and accustomed to go see the endocrinologist for this problem or the kidney specialist for that problem. And and that's because of the structure of corporate medicine today? A lot of it is. So, you know, the primary care docs would love to be able to take care of some of that stuff. Obviously, again, I would never, uh, there are certain things that, you know, need to be passed off. There's an appropriate line where the primary care doc says, you know, this is something above where, you know, I need some help with this. Um, but a lot of it is the way the structure is. If you come into the office and you've already got two or three problems and then you add another, all of a sudden it becomes from a time perspective, you know, when you only have five to 15 minutes with a patient to address all those issues and address them appropriately, uh, that's very difficult to do in a very short period of time. So the easiest way to do that is to then farm out some of that work and say, you know, hey, I can't deal with the, the kidney issue. I need another, I need somebody else to have their five or 10 minutes with you for this issue. Um, whereas in direct primary care, if I know that people have those, those many or that many issues, you know, we, we just set aside the time to deal with that and say, Hey, you know, this person needs an hour. Hey, maybe this person might need an hour and a half this visit because something new is coming up, but they still have other stuff. You know, we set a, 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 apart that time for that particular patient to do that. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if I am enrolled in primary care, you, you don't take insurance. So it's just that $99 subscription, but I can still see you and have insurance for other issues, right? I mean, there's, there's no problem there. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So we don't bill the insurance um, from that perspective, but we will utilize your insurance for other purposes. So if you need to have imaging studies, an MRI, a CT scan, things like that, you know, we'll we'll be happy to, you know, even some insurance companies have what they call prior authorization, which means you have to you have to tell them or give them reasons why you should um you know, have to have this test. You know, being a doctor now doesn't give you enough authority to do that. You have to actually provide them proof uh, that they need these tests. So isn't that crazy that, that uh, it's, not, it's not your recommendation that matters, it's whether or not they agree with your recommendation? Absolutely. So, and there's two great things about direct primary care. So one is, you know, oftentimes we can go through that process with people um, with the prior authorizations and do that for them and then give the insurance uh, information to the, you know, different places, the lab, the radiologist, the, um, again, the, the specialists kind of do their own thing as far as dealing with that. But um, the second way we deal with this is we oftentimes partner with places that are able to give us better pricing to not go through the insurance. So in those circumstances, again, it may make sense for people with high deductible plans that have insurance, you know, hey, maybe we can get an MRI done for $700 um, at an independent imaging place. We don't have to go through the, the rigmarole of, you know, dealing with insurance. Oftentimes we get them in pretty quickly. So, you know, we've got a, a direct imaging place here that we can get them in the same day or next day sometimes. Whereas if we go to the major health systems, it may be two or three weeks before we get those tests done. So yeah. we try to find other avenues for people to be able to do that. And with you having a high deductible plan, potentially, let's say your deductible is $3,000, you know, you're going to hit that deductible if you get that MRI done at the major institution. That, that MRI there is going to be three to $6,000. So you're immediately going to hit that deductible over it. But for $700, you can still put that toward your deductible and you're paying a lot less out of pocket. So there, it, it's, yeah. it's a balancing game for some people. And I tell people all the time, I don't know what your insurance plan does. And I don't know how, honestly, I don't know how my insurance plan works a lot of the times. <laughs> I do the best I can and try to figure it out. Um, but uh, I tell people, you know, hey, it may be cheaper for you to just pay cash for this at this place, you know, send it to your insurance against your deductible and call it a day. So what hasn't worked out quite the way you thought it would? It can't all be sunshine and rainbows in direct primary care. What, what's not quite been on target? Uh, I would say the biggest challenge is maybe dealing with some of the bigger health systems, um, being recognized by those health systems, uh, being able to um, coordinate uh, with those big health systems, because a lot of times, you know, they 
refer within themselves. You know, they send people in mm-hmm. that same path um, and direction. And so I found it somewhat difficult to, um, you know, navigate the system outside of the system. Uh, and, and that's, it, it's unfortunate that it's that way because, again, from, from a corporate perspective, why wouldn't you want somebody who you're not paying or have any, anything to do with as far as overhead still referring to you? Um, they, they make it difficult. Um, and maybe that's a regional thing. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how the other direct primary care practices have, you know, dealt with situations like this, but I have heard stories where, you know, there have been, unfortunately, places where people have, um, gotten contracts with different companies. So a whole company for direct primary care practice, and that company, um, has also has insurance that, that is directed towards one healthcare system. And the healthcare system has conned to that company and said, hey, if, you, if you're partnering with this direct care practice, you know, we will no longer accept you as part of this plan. Um, it's become mm-hmm. strong handed and it seems silly, but, you know, that's the way corporate business works. Uh, healthcare is not healthcare anymore. It's business. And that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, as the patient, uh, you know, I'm what matters, uh, not whether or not your offices are full, Mr. Hospital Network. So can you admit patients to a hospital in direct primary care? Can you see them once I'm admitted? So technically you could. So if you applied for privileges at a hospital, um, and I'm sure there are some direct primary care practices that do this, um, you know, you could you could do that. I think um, it becomes more difficult from just a logistics perspective to be able to handle all those things. Um, you know, as a one provider clinic that we are, uh, being able to manage hospital outside the hospital and be able to give the patients the attention, it's just not possible. You know, as mm-hmm. this grows and as people add things to their practices, maybe it is, and uh, there may be some direct primary care practices that can do that. Um, it's within the, our scope, you know, could we do it? Sure. Um, it's just a matter of balancing that time and figuring out whether or not that is um, something that we can still provide the best service for. So I know you're board certified in internal medicine, also family practice, mm-hmm. but if I have a condition that requires hospitalization, you're going to suggest that I see a doctor within that hospital network to get admitted. Is that how that works? So oftentimes uh, the hospitals have hospitalists. So, I mean, just specific doctors who admit patients to the hospital, they're usually general practice. Um, they are specialized, and, and this is something I have done and actually still do on an occasion, in just taking care of inpatient issues, those very acute issues. Um, what has happened over time, hospitalists are really, really great at what they do in the hospital. Uh, but what I think a lot of hospital systems have found is that that transition outside the hospital after those visits uh, becomes a little bit disjointed. Uh, because again, it takes a while to get into the primary care doctor, They then have to figure out what had happened, why they were in the hospital. They don't have but five or 10 minutes to do that and and try to uh, wrap everything up for that hospital stated, all the changes that have happened. So that post-hospital care has become a little bit disjointed and a lot more difficult and has actually caused a lot of people to essentially bounce back to the hospital because they didn't get the follow-up they needed fast enough. So that is one thing that direct primary care can change a little bit in those post-hospital visits. We, again, have the time to go over everything that happened, all the changes that happened during the hospitalization, making sure that patients understand those changes because when those changes are made quickly in a time when they're already under distress, um, they may not understand kind of everything that they're supposed to do. So it's some it's an opportunity for us in the direct yeah. primary care practice to sit down with them and, and get them to understand, hey, what are these changes? Why did we do those changes? Um, are those changes even appropriate for you? Um, again, every every patient's care should be individualized. It shouldn't be, you know, you're going to be on this, 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 and this for, you know, for these reasons. There may be reasons why we wouldn't want patients on that, um, and we need to address those things. I get it. So you're saying just because the protocol post-hospitalization is X, Y, Z, that may not be what's right for me, but it's just easier for them to follow the protocol. Yeah, well, it's... And, It's not just easier. There are certain mandates um, for certain conditions that patients have to be, they have to have certain testing done, they have to have certain medications given to them, they have to be discharged on certain medications. Um, And if you don't do that, there's a lot of paperwork and and a lot of things that go along with that. So it's Mm -hmm. easier to just follow the the click boxes that you have to check for the insurance company. 
Um, it's an insurance mandate. It has nothing to do necessarily with your care, what's best for you. It's what the insurance company tells you you have to do to get that patient home to be able to be paid for their visit. Got it. So um, what do other doctors have to say uh, to you when they find out you're in practicing direct primary care? Are, are they envious? Are they skeptical? What, where does it come down? So I think most of them are envious uh, at the time that we're able to spend and what we're able to do. I think a lot of them um, are nervous about it because they don't quite understand it. They, you know, it's just the opposite of what most physicians are doing these days. Most physicians are joining big groups and practices because uh, direct primary care is running a business. Uh, and as physicians, we're not trained to be business people. We're trained to be doctors. We're trained to take care of people. We're, you know, the business side of that's not something we typically um, would do. And so I think there, um, as a physician, there's so many burdens and so many extra things that we have to do behind the scenes when you're part of the system that they're like, I don't know how I could even, you know, begin to add to that. But what I've found in direct primary care is, is it's less complicated. So because it's less complicated, there's less stuff to do behind the scenes. I've got more time with patients. I don't have all this extra stuff that I'm doing outside the room with patients. I have the time to do the business stuff. And honestly, it's a learning curve. There's no question. But mm -hmm. it's, you know, we went through, you know, college and medical school and training and, and, and you know, it, it's not something we can't handle. Um, yeah. It's something that learning is uh, something doctors are pretty good at. Yeah, exactly. I get that. So it's just yeah. it's taking that leap of faith. Um, and I think some of them are. Um, you know, worried a little bit about, you know, again, the same thing I talked about earlier, you know, how do I, as you know, David compete against the Goliaths in town? How is that going to go over? Uh, and I think it, it just takes somebody to, you know, get out there to start that, that, that trend um, in, in cities. And once it gets started, you know, patients love it. And so once they get identified, it, it's going to be hard to ignore. So if I am thinking that I want to know more about direct primary care, and I, I, there's a directory, I'll link to that in the show notes, a nationwide directory of, of uh, direct primary care practices. But how do I know which doctor is right for me? Do you have an introductory appointment? How do you, how do you screen each other to see if you're a good fit? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like anything. Um, when you develop a partnership with a doctor, you, you really want somebody that you can sit down and talk to and feel comfortable with. And, you know, oftentimes, I don't think people really understand that. Sometimes they're actually assigned a doctor um, and they think that that's just the doctor they have to go to. Um, and they may not mesh with that particular person. And I think they feel guilty sometimes for asking, you know, hey, I'd like to see someone else. Um, and that's okay. It's absolutely okay. Um, as physicians, you know, we should understand it's not personal. It's really just about that relationship. And if it's not the right relationship, that's okay. So, and I don't, again, I can, I can't speak for other direct primary care practices, but I do have people who call the office and say, Hey, I'd like to just sit down and chat with you uh, before I become a member or before I join the direct primary care. And we absolutely do that. We'll sit down and talk to him for again, 30 minutes, an hour, answer all their questions, you know, make sure that they feel comfortable with the situation. Um, and, you know, to date, I have not had anybody have one of those initial visits and not join. That's great to hear. So tell me about, um, well, give me a closing thought. What do you want people to know about direct primary care? If they're on the fence and they're kind of thinking about, well, I'm not sure this is right for me or I'm really interested and I'd like to know more, what will you say to them? I would say just go, you know, seek out, you know, more answers, you know, whatever their individual questions are, whatever they're, they're you know, worried about, go, you know, reach out to the direct primary care practices. Um, you know, every one of us that chooses to do direct primary care is in it for um, the reasoning that we talked about earlier. It's about, you know, directly your care. And so individualizing those questions and being able to talk to, to you know, first people about what their individual questions are, be able to answer them and allay their fears. Um, because again, there's a lot of fears that come across, uh, like I said, throughout the, you know, show here. Uh, that people don't necessarily understand because they're just so used to what the regular system looks like. You know, this literally is like going back to, you know, the day where, you know, doctors did house calls and they knew your family and, uh, you know, that type of medicine, but in a modern environment. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would say that if people have any questions or fears about that, reach out and talk to one of us. We'll happy to answer those questions. Are there any conditions that probably don't fit 
for direct primary care? I'm, I'm assuming cancer is, is one that might be difficult for a DPC to manage, but um, if I have complex diabetes, autoimmune disorders, that kind of thing, is that something that works well in direct primary care or should I look in a more traditional avenue? I would say that it works well from the respects that we have more time to deal with those issues that are a little bit more complex. Um, so when you talk about cancer, of course, that's not something a direct primary care practice can, you know, can do. Uh, but however, I will say, you know, a lot of the cancer networks and things like that, um, you know, we have the ability to help with some of the side effects of the treatments. You know, can we get them in to do other things? Um, can we help them from a non-traditional medicine standpoint? Can we do uh, some of the supplements? Can we do, um, you know, other things to help along that process? Can we just be a support to the patient and their family that they don't maybe get somewhere else? Absolutely. There are certain things that we can be add-ons to as well. We may not be the primary um, you know, person in those groups, but we can certainly add on to their treatment plan uh, and help navigate their treatment plan too. Again, you talk about rheumatologic diseases, cancer, you know, all these things. Oftentimes those don't come as an isolated thing. They may, um, but oftentimes these patients have, you know, multiple things going on with them and they really need somebody to coordinate those things. They really need to look at some, somebody to look at the big picture of those things because oftentimes, you know, one specialist deals with their little bit, another specialist deals with their little bit, and nobody's looking at everything. Um, nobody's looking at how these medications are interacting. You know, maybe they're on two treatments that are, you know, could be combined to one um, and, and solve, you know, and work with both. You know, there are so many opportunities and things that pri primary care doctors and, and the direct primary care practice can add to those things. Again, we, we can't do everything. There's no question. Uh, there are certain things that we have to do, but do you have to be in the system? Not necessarily. It just, it, it depends. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you. It's Dr. Jared Wegman of Indiana Direct Primary Care. He practices in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and is one of more than 2,000 doctors who've now stepped out of traditional health care as we know it today and going their own way. And that trend is growing across the country. Dr. Wegman, continued success. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. I appreciate it.